Welcome to Passion. I'm your host, Britt Ivey, and thank you so much for joining us today on Passion. And we have with us today international authors and relationship coaches, husband and wife, Kim and Steve Cooper. Hello, Kim. Hello, Steve. Hi, Britt. Hello, Britt. Thank you so much for joining us today on Passion, all the way from Australia. It's the middle of summer here now, so we're in a nice, cool studio. Thank heavens for that. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you on air today, and we're here to speak about your revolutionary work in regards to relationships, um, <clears throat> troubled relationships, and we have a couple clips for our audience. And Kim, you've written seven, eight books now. Can you want to tell us a little bit about your, your life's work here? <laughs> um, I lose track sometimes now. Um, I guess, you know, the most important thing to say about my books is that originally they were really written for myself. Um, I, I began studying and researching to try and um, solve the problems that we were having in our own marriage. And I found that self-help books tend to be very long and sometimes um, only have a few little bits of advice in them. So I started making notes for myself and, and making them easier to reference so that I could, <coughs> could find it easier and get back to it. And um, yeah, that was the beginning. And I still actually go back and, <laughs> and read my books now and then um, because I, you know I'm not really the expert. It was, I needed the advice as much as anyone. Wonderful. Well, um, having to actually find solutions yourself, I would imagine, would drive the work even deeper in, into your soul, really, and, and being able to um, interpret behavior that you see in other relationships that you had to interpret yourself for your relationship, almost like a detective, you say, in, in your first book, Back Through the Looking Glass. You talk about having to be a detective to try to figure out what was going on in your husband's mind and, and psyche because you knew that he loved you, but the behavior was, was very tough. And, and we're going to look at a clip here in a moment to show the audience a short clip about kind of where you were at that point of time. Okay? So in a moment here, we're going to go to clip one. A long time ago, I was treating Kim really badly. Actually, I was just blaming everything that was wrong in my life on her. But now I know I'm the luckiest guy in the world because Kim stood by me and cared about me enough to figure out what it was she had to do to deal with the way I was treating her. If you're in a troubled relationship and there's a lot of blame being thrown around, I know that it can be very difficult to get to the bottom of where the trouble is coming from. I know back when Steve and I were fighting, he would blame me for everything that was going wrong and really I would believe that sometimes. That was extremely painful for me because in my heart I knew that I was doing everything I could to really help our relationship Which be a better one. Running. And so I couldn't figure out why when that was what was in my heart things could just be going as badly as they were. Because we know that you might be feeling this way too, we've put together three questions that you can ask yourself that will help you get to the source of the trouble in your relationship very quickly and know for sure that you're not the one to blame. Well, here we are back on air. Um, that was a wonderful clip um, and you spoke about your relationship and, and they actually had um, a little, uh, you showed part of your logo behind there which is a life preserver and your website for the audience that are, Kim and Steve Cooper's website, they have three, um, is thelovesafetynet.com. And I think you can see that on the screen right now. And uh, I love that logo of the life preserver. I also love that it's red, white, and blue. I don't know what Australia's colors are, but sorry. <laughs> love the United States of America. Um, tell the audience, please, a little bit about that clip and what you were feeling when you made that and where you found yourselves in relationship. Well, I think the clip was really about establishing ourselves as people who have been prepared to look at the tough stuff in our relationship. So the clip was really designed and performed by us 
in a way that we could just tell people that we're for real. Because very early on in our uh, work, a lot of people who we were interacting with online didn't believe that we were real, that we were just some schmuck making it all up, that we'd made <laughs> different characters, that Kim was somebody else and had made up my character. And so we had, yeah, mm. yeah, so we had to, so I mean, the, the whole, the whole uh, reason for us doing that at the beginning was to say, well, we're going to have to show people we're for real and that we are a real couple. Um, but also, mm. I think it's really important for people to see that a couple have worked it out. With so many of the people that we work with, they haven't got a relationship in their lives where they've seen it get better for a lot of people. Mm. So that was really one of the main reasons why we put this together. We're going to have to, Kim and Steve, we're going to have to be out there as much as we can talking like we are now, uh, showing people that you can fix your relationship. And that's very powerful in itself because we're putting the power back in the people's hands. That was embarrassing for us in the beginning, but after we'd actually fixed up our own marriage, um, we really just realised that we just couldn't keep quiet because there was just too many people suffering that we really felt like we needed to help. I understand, and um, it's it's a, a big adventure you two have embarked on, and, and I think you're both quite brave, and I know you've been um, into this work pretty deeply now for for over seven years and uh, your marriage has lasted how many years have you been married 21 years all right congratulations so the Thank first you. years were were pretty difficult and um, the first 10 <laughs> the first 10 so I'd like to talk about two things one you just mentioned um, establishing yourself with that clip as real people because um, traditionally, uh, the field of psychology uh, in these types of relationships really gives a very small percentage of hope uh, of, success, of successfully overcoming these difficulties and having a marriage that is thriving like yours is and now as your best friends and, and um, actually in business together. You know, it's just, it's amazing. And um, I was saying in the, the pre-interview here. I think I'm going to end up crying on the, the first time crying on the show, but you know, I don't care. Anyway, um, I have the best audience. I have a great crew here too, by the way, which uh, at the end, those graphics will show the, the crew here. But I've got an amazing crew here today as we Skype you in from Australia. And um, uh, I just feel so fortunate to have met you guys and be working with you. So back on track here. Um, facing an entire field that says, you know, these are the type of relationships you, you should really put on the scrap heap. And you're facing that and you have found some data as the Nancy Drew uh, detective, Kim, um, <laughs> to lead this marriage back into a position that hopefully now we help to, we hope to help, you know, thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people worldwide really, that is, that is your life's mission. And, you know, there is something, of course, called the DSM, Diagnostic Manual, that uh, psychologists use. And these um, relationships that sometimes are termed abusive or difficult or, or what have you, you have found that really is a dance between um, a codependent and a, and a narcissist. And in the DSM, you know, the definition of narcissism, uh, it's not a pretty picture. And they basically say there's no cure, there's no help. These are horrible people, yada, yada. Now, um, due to your work, that definition has changed a little bit for the better. And um, your books and especially the Love Safety Net workbook, I really want to point that out to our audience. The Love Safety Net workbook is transformational work. And it gives tools on four pillars um, of rebuilding these types of relationships and we're showing a shot of the cover of that workbook right now to our audience and the concepts these four pillars of attachment limiting abuse emotional intelligence and filling in your gaps developmentally um, really are the four pillars that we will talk about in subsequent shows but this is revolutionary just realizing that these people um, that are stuck in these relationships um, 
are really looking at um, lacking in those four categories. So I've spoken a lot more than I expected to right now. So <laughs> Kim, maybe you could elaborate a little bit to our audience how your work has shown that, you know, there is hope. Hmm. Um, well, um, I think I'll just start by explaining that, you know, my, my father was a doctor who worked in general practice and, you know, I grew up in a medical family. We'd often, you know, we'd help out in, in his surgery, as they call it, in Australia. Um, it wasn't actually where they do surgery, but that's just what they call the consultation, the doctor's consultation rooms here, they call it a surgery. And um, so when, when Steve was first assessed as having narcissistic personality disorder, I thought, well, great, um, diagnosis is 99% of the cure. And, um, you know, I know, I know what the problem is now. And so I'll be able to get in and do something about it. Well, then when I turned around and they said, oh, no, there is no cure. You just need to change the locks and, <laughs> and, or, or, or divorce him and never speak to him again. I was just shocked because, I mean, I'd never heard of any kind of disorder that said that you were actually meant to abandon a family member. I, I mean, that just seemed completely against the whole Hippocratic Oath and all of that to me. Mm. Um, it just it felt so wrong. And I'm really glad I went with my instincts there because I just said this can't be right. Um, at the same time, Steve was, his behavior was very difficult to live with. Um, it, it was just something like I'd never really experienced and never want to experience again. And it had gone on for years. Um, so I guess the first step that I took is I just decided, well, if, if traditional marriage counseling isn't going to give me um, any hope, I'll, I'll have to turn and look at um, modalities where you can't in, insist that the person leave. Um, so I looked at parent training because no matter how badly your child's behaving, no one's going to tell you that you should actually just change the locks or never speak to them again. Right. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, and I also, then I started looking at corporate leadership training, um, because, you know, no kind of manager is going to get away with just firing every employee that he, every difficult employee that he has difficulties with. Um, and right. Suddenly I discovered this whole world of information that was very, very different from traditional marriage counseling. It, very little of it was about talk. Hardly any of it was about talk. Instead, it was learning practical skills um, that, that you could put in place of learning how to respond to situations differently, um, learning how to role model the behavior that, that, you, that you wanted, learning how to effectively set boundaries. And, you know, it was a very long process and it was a process of uh, where I was experimenting on myself because, I mean, I was only <laughs> just developing these ideas and there was a few setbacks along the way. But, no, it, it, um, it did give me hope in the beginning because I, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to give up on my marriage. I had, I had three children under 10 at that stage and I was just shocked that that was you know that the only advice the professionals could give me was is that I should just leave and I mean how was I never going to con be in contact again with somebody who I shared three children with I mean right. it just didn't make sense right right and and you know on one hand um, you went to many professionals is my understanding um, and while they were saying just leave change the locks forget it, there's, you know, no human's ever gotten through this and there's just a cold heart in there and, and you know, good luck and, and almost... The police you're, had told me that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they, they kind of told you, you know, you're nuts if you stay, lady, all this, this type of stuff. Yeah. And, and the part of you inside that um, searched for these other ways, these other avenues of helping someone you love, I mean, that's just brilliant. Parent training, I've actually read a couple of the the books that you mentioned as references in in your work and um, amazing tools. I mean, the lack of just building attachment um, is it's a skill in today's world. Of it used to be, you know, in my generation, it was a six second attention span. Now kids maybe have a three second attention span. You know, if you're lucky, and just building attachment, just small things like sending flowers, giving your spouse a picture for your wallet, little things that used to be just rudimentary everyday attachment building methods are, are like 
history, you know, throw them a cell phone and a computer and, and they're off. And then, um, anyway, before I get too far out to where we don't have time for the next clip, the next clip that we have, um, clip number two, really shows a little bit about um, what you've been speaking about. So let's play that for our audience and, and then come back and, and see where we're at. Thank you so much, you two. I don't think it's an academic you want when you have a love-hate relationship and it's on the rocks. When your relationship's in trouble, I think you want to find out how to fix it from someone who has fixed it before. And I tell you, that's Kim. And I always loved Kim, but you know, I can't tell you how much she's learned and grown. We get a bit of criticism now and then, and the criticism that's leveled at us is that we're encouraging people to stay in abusive relationships. And that really isn't our message at all, because if somebody wants to leave um, their marriage or wants to leave their partner, we actually offer advice to help them do that and to, to actually get closure on the conflict. But I also think that, you know, since maybe the 50s and before when people were trapped in loveless marriages and it wasn't socially acceptable for people to divorce and the generation that came before mine really fought very hard to, to make divorce um, an acceptable option. But I also feel that the pendulum has probably swung too far the other way. And that means that now people who are having difficulties with their marriage, but you know maybe are lacking the skills that they need to make their marriage work, are not being taught these skills or offered the help that they need, just in the same way as I don't think anyone should be forced to stay in a marriage that they don't want to be part of. It's also wrong to insist that people divorce and particularly to make out like that's an easy solution. What's important is that the conflict be resolved. Um, that's important for everyone and it's especially important for children. Online we can be there for people and offer our private story and hopefully help them get to some place more positive. Well, hi, you two. Um, that was very emotional and uh, really a, a wonderful clip. And um, I'm fidgeting here a little bit with my microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's just really, really touching. And, and you know, we're not saying anything um, negative about the professionals and the people that have tried to deal with this. Um, issue for decades, for, for centuries, for, you know, for the beginning of time, I'm sure. It's just not, not knowing. Um, and the fact that um, you actually looked in these other avenues, Kim, is just mind-blowing to me. I, I think that's a godsend. I really do. Um, I do believe that there's a, a bit of heaven at work there um, that would give you that insight. And as funny as it sounds, you actually recommend to uh, your clients, I know, uh, uh, it's as silly as it may sound at first, uh, the Super Nanny uh, television show has some, some really um, good tips on how to deal with this because really what you have found is there's basically an adult brat in, in the narcissist. And um, tell me a, a little bit about that because once you kind of found that key and quote, the adult brat sees, oh my gosh, this person is not going to leave me. I can't believe it. There's, maybe there's something wrong with her. I've been able to, to bully and, and belittle and, and you know, yeah. badger her into doing whatever I, I needed, and, and she's not going to leave. I mean, how was that for you, Steve, when she started doing her work, when Kim started doing her work, um, you know, and people had said, just leave, and she didn't leave, and, and uh, yeah. after your diagnosis, and, and here you are, were you helping her at this point? Um, how, how were you doing when she was making these changes? Well, things got worse for a little while because I, I, uh, I built a system of getting my way. Mm. That system was being an adult brat. 
and throwing tantrums when I needed to negotiate. So at the essence of our work and a lot of what Kim writes about is building negotiation skills for both people in the relationship. Okay. It's extremely important. So I guess getting back to, to us and our story, I had very little uh, idea about how to negotiate what I needed. And then when Kim wanted to negotiate something that she needed, I'd not let her because I didn't know how to negotiate for myself. So very quickly you can see that adult-child relationship happening there. Right. So I think, I think that um, uh, looking at that now, it's, it's quite embarrassing for me. It's, it's, it's horrifying for me to think that that was me only, you know, 10 years ago or so. Right. And you, sorry to interrupt you, but this is important yeah. because we're speaking kind of at a high level here and, and for our audience that's watching that is really going through, uh, you know, the depths of despair um, and, yeah. and giving hope that they too can recover. I mean, you were hiding things from Kim. How did you come around to admitting some of the behavior and are you, um, you know, open to, to sharing some of the things that you were doing in the relationship back then? Well, Kim was able with her fantastic uh, skills, Nancy Drew skills, was just able <laughs> to find out a lot of the stuff by herself and then confront me in a certain way and I was, you know, and uh, I guess before we, we talk about my change, which is always very difficult, to talk about because it was a series of events and there's more important information peppered through that story. Um, I think it's very difficult to really get a beginning point. And I think that's really always we struggle with that, don't we, Kim? Mm. What was the real beginning? Kim started learning. So if, if I can choose a point, Kim decided that things were going to change. That was the very first, that was the very first point. And then she wouldn't put up with the behavior and that she'd confront me on the behavior, that she'd talk about it. But then she started using different tactics than what she used in the past. Mm. So that was really important. A lot of those tactics are in the book, Back from the Looking Glass. And we talk about it on various blogs and very, uh, on all of our content. We talk about that a lot. So from there, I thought, well, now, I think Kim's not listening to my BS anymore. And I started thinking, I'm going to need to be careful. What do I do? Can I just make an even bigger scene? And that was one of the things we were doing. A very important word that we use in our work is confabulation. And confabulation, if you want to look up in the dictionary, says something like uh, <laughs> a means by which you create various incorrect stories threaded through the truth. Rewriting history, to basically. To rewrite history. Yeah. Confabulation. So I'm guilty as charged. I was the biggest confabulator in town at the time. But are you going to be honest about some of the things you were hiding? I think that's what she asked. Sure. Well, I was hiding, <laughs> sure. well, I was hiding a line of credit that uh, Kim didn't know about. Two. Two? <laughs> Two credit cards. Two credit cards. Okay. Two lines of credit. Okay. Uh, I was hiding uh, pornography addiction. I was hiding a, I had a very, uh, I was, I was one of, as a narcissist, I was someone that was always looking for people that I could get supply from. So there was girls that I knew around town that I'd get supply from. Meaning they, they would just be, they, they would just be sweet to you. Because we have just a few minutes left in this show and we're fortunate enough to have part two coming up. But basically all that is, is you need, you were getting attention for your ego from these girls. You weren't necessarily out, you know, having a, affairs, but just getting right. emotional attention. That's right. And, and then as things became safer for, for you, then now you guys can get that and give that to one another. That's right. Yes. Well, that was the problem. I mean, I was right. just never, I never wanted to be home. Right. So. Right. And there uh, was fights, and then we were fighting, and then it, there was trouble. Right. In fact, um, stopthefights.com uh, is, is also, I believe, a website that people can yep. still find. <clears throat> I love that one. That's, that's really a fun website. And, you know, I, I just commend you guys for being so uh, frank and candid. I just took a. Um, a marriage seminar that was just fantastic and and the husband and wife were both pastors and they shared um, part of what you just shared about that you know very tough 
um, addiction early in their marriage and people were just shocked you know people don't talk about that it's very brave and there are millions of people out there I'm sure spouses husbands and wives have credit cards and they're just afraid to tell their spouse so these are all just little symptoms of really what you lived and um, I just thank you so much for being just so present and open and so excited for the next show that we're gonna film today and offer some tools um, so other people that have been told to shut the door, leave town, uh, change your phone number, and there's no hope for this type of dance uh, between, you know, narcissism and codependence, that we've given some hope today, hopefully, for that. I'm just so grateful to have met you two, and you've just been a, a wonderful resource for me and a wonderful... Um, Okay, if you're going to cry, I'm going to cry. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, I'm just really proud of you. And I can imagine having to walk through, I still say H-E double toothpicks because my mom taught me to say that as a kid, but just walk through um, the valley of the shadow of death and come through mm -hmm. the other side and have something to offer people that are in love but in enormous amounts of pain with mm -hmm. no seeming way out. So um, That is where I was. Yeah. Yep, and um, I just can't thank you guys enough, and, and I'm so grateful to be a part of delivering this body of work. So we will see you in a few minutes in, in part two, and they're telling me to wrap up here. So any just last quickly, words? They want the three questions. They need to go to narcissismcure.com. Oh, thank you. Yes, in the clip, <laughs> you mentioned the three questions. Very yeah, valuable. If they're interested, it's at, it's at narcissismcured.com. You'll find, if you sign up, you'll find out the three questions. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, you two, thank you so very much. I'm looking forward to you, seeing you on the next episode of Passion. Bye. Thank you, Brent. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.